Thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. Uh, yeah, punting is uh, definitely an excellent pastime if anyone is ever in Oxford or Cambridge. Totally recommend it. Very relaxing um, and a great way to um, stay dry while traveling down the river if you are good at it. Uh, so last week, Arthur gave us a fantastic overview of electron microscopy. Um, that is now available online for anyone who wants to go back and, and hear that. We put that video up on YouTube and you can also access that from the CNS website as well. But today we're going to look in detail at a technique called energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, which is an electron microscopy based technique. So here's an overview of what we'll be discussing today. We'll start with an introduction to a few key concepts of EDS. This section is primarily aimed at those of you who do not have much experience uh, yet with this technique, providing an overview of what the technique is, what questions it is used to address, and what information it can give us. We'll then look at some aspects of the hardware and learn about how the signal is detected and processed. And then once we have that signal, we need to figure out a way to interpret that. So in the third section, we'll talk about how the data is analyzed and look under the hood, as Arthur would say, at what the software is doing uh, during the analysis. Then in the last section, uh, we'll wrap up with some practical tips and techniques that I hope will be useful when you're doing EDS next time so that you'll feel confident that you're collecting data in the optimal way. Okay. So in an electron microscope, at a very basic level, we have an electron beam of well-defined energy, which is directed at a localized area of the specimen. When this occurs, the electrons can interact with the sample, producing various types of phenomena or signals. Many of these signals involve a loss in energy um, of the out outgoing electron, or more, ge or more generally, outgoing particle which we call the inelastic scattering event. And a few of those are shown over here. In many cases, by measuring the energy of the emitted particle, whatever it may be, uh, we can collect information that tells us about the specimen in the vicinity of where the electron beam hit it. As you can see from these diagrams, there's lots of choice about the type of signal that can be collected and therefore analyzed. Uh, depending on what we need to find out about the sample, we might choose to collect multiple signals at the same time so we can understand more information about the sample. However, in today's uh, webinar, we're just gonna focus on one of the types of signal and that's the X-ray emission. Now we've got to advance the slide. There we go. Okay, so energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, which I usually refer to as EDS for short, is an electron microscopy based technique that's been used since the 1960s. It's one of the most common pieces of peripheral equipment on SCMs and is also found on modern TMs. Uh, principles of this technique, how the detectors work, and what information can be obtained on the SEM or on the TM um, are gonna form most of the content we'll talk about. And we're gonna base it so that we can cover both techniques um, from the majority of what I'll talk about today. As we mentioned previously, uh, in EDS, we collect the X-rays emitted from the specimen that were generated in the interaction of the primary electron beam with the sample. We analyze their energy from, and from this, we can learn about the local chemical composition on the specimen. So the spectrum on the right-hand side there is an example of what we output from EDS, and we name this the EDS spectrum. We'll go into detail in a bit, but you can see that we have lots of labels of elements and in the top hand right, we have relative compositions. Um, so 
In EDS, the questions that we might be on, looking to answer are what elements are in my specimen, where are they spatially located, and what are their relative abundance. Now, it's possible this all may sound familiar to you, but you didn't recognize the title of this talk. That's because EDS has many names. I've listed some of them here on this slide. Um, it's a good idea to be familiar with this list, especially if you're searching through the literature. Okay, so this is an important slide. Uh, it explains how we generate the signal for EDS. Last week, Arthur produced uh, many images of the Bohr model, and uh, this is what's roughly sketched here. We have, in this case, a yellow nucleus and a brown ultra electron, so brown electron shells. So the incoming beam in the electron microscope, which is drawn here as a solid blue downwards arrow, uh, is typically at least a few kV for an, in an SEM and often hundreds of kV for in a TM. Such energy is sufficiently high that the beam energy can cause a series of transitions within the atoms of the specimen. What happens here is that an outer inner electron is ejected, leaving behind a hole, which we see here as the white circle. Now, the atom has become ionized and left in its excited state with a vacancy in the core shell from which the initial electron was knocked out of. This system is unstable, and so de-excitation can occur. There are a couple of pathways for this relaxation event, but in the case of EDS, what happens is the outer energy electron drops down to fill the core vacancy. Now, as Arthur discussed, there's an energy difference between the energy levels and we need to obey the conservation of energy rules. Therefore, when the electron drops down, energy must be released. This energy release is in the form of a photon in the case of EDS. The energy of the photon is determined by the difference in energy between the two shells. And it happens that this is in the X-ray region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Therefore, an X-ray is emitted. Okay, so now we know what's happening in the specimen. Uh, what we need to know next is how do we use these X-rays to extract meaningful information about the sample? Those of you who have performed EDS before might be familiar with something that looks like this. This is an EDS spectrum again. What we're plotting here is number of counts on the y-axis and energy on the x-axis. To generate the spectrum, what we've done is to measure the energy of the x-rays entering the detector as a function of time. We usually collect for at least a minute, often longer. Uh, so if an x-ray is emitted from a sample, it was detected to have an energy of say 6.4 EV, then you would see a peak corresponding right here, if you can see that pointer. Um, so you add one count at a time, depending on where the energy of the x-ray detectors was. As you can see, we need to collect hundreds of thousands of x-rays to generate spectrum. And we'll talk about the requirements of signal to noise at the very end of today's webinar. Uh, as we collect more and more x-rays, we start to see some features appear. These are in the form of characteristic peaks. These peaks are due to allowed transitions between electronic states in the atom present in the material. We also see a smooth background which is labeled there. This is generated by the electrons changing speed within the specimen. So we'll go into detail on both of these concepts shortly, but for now the takeaway message that I want to give is that EDS spectrum comprises characteristic peaks superimposed on a smooth background. Okay, so just to recap, because it's an important concept. Um, in EDS, what happens is the instant beam electrons excite a core electron, create a hole. This is unstable, and an outer electron relaxes. An X-ray is emitted, and the energy of that X-ray corresponds to the difference in energy between the outer electron shell and where the hole is created. Okay. 
So we saw on the previous slide the EDS spectra contain lots and lots of peaks. So we're going to need some conventions for naming these peaks so we can tr keep track of what's going on. First convention I'm going to introduce here is the naming of the shell that was responsible for the X-ray emission. We name this after the shell that the hole was created in. So that's where the initial electron was knocked out of. If the hole was created in the innermost shell, then we call it a K-peak. The next shell out is an L, the one after that, M, and so on, of the alphabet. And you can see those marks on the, the diagram on the left there. Copy here. So, but what, as, as Arthur alluded to in his talk last week, uh, the Bohr method is a simplified model, and we need to turn to quantum mechanics to better understand the interband transitions. Each of the shells of the Bohr model has multiple orbitals or levels, and the number of which increases the quantum number. Quantum mechanics dictates that the selection rules are in place, which dictate which transitions are allowed between the different levels. This is actually good news for us because it simplifies the EDS spectra, makes it easier to interpret them, and gives us a model to compare to. For example, um, you can't have an S to S transition, but you can have a P to S transition. So on the right hand side here, we've got various transitions marked. Um, between the K, the L, and the M shells. Now, at this point, I don't want you to be memorizing all of these different transitions. Um, turns out we don't actually need to do that because all of this information is readily available in the EDS software and in tables. My point here is really that there are several transitions and that their origin is well understood. You see that we use different Greek letters to denote the various transitions and then subscripts to further discriminate between the transitions. So we have a mechanism in place to distinguish between these different peaks. The energy difference between the bands and levels changes as you go out towards the outer shells. The largest energy difference is between the innermost and second shell. And so therefore the K transitions will have the largest energy. The next largest gap is between the second and third shells, which correspond to the L series. And the M series is therefore of lower energy, as you can see. Uh, the energy differences of these levels for each element can be calculated. Therefore, by matching up the peaks in the EDS spectrum to the expected allowed transitions for each element, we can assign peaks to certain elements, as we'll see in the next slide. So this is an example of an EDS spectrum which contains sets of lines from three different elements. If you look at the spectrum itself, on the very far right, we have two peaks over here. They're around 4.5 and 4.9 keV. These two peaks are characteristic of a K series, where there are two main peaks, one called K alpha and one called K beta. Now, you may recall from the previous slide that there were more lines drawn on the diagram than what we can see here. Um, that's because sometimes these peaks are so close in energy that we can't distinguish them in the EDS spectra and they effectively merge. We can look up in a table or from a database the expected energy of various K peaks from each element and match those to the K and alpha peaks measured here, from which we identify this as being titanium. One important feature that I'd like to point out is that the alpha peak is the most intense and the beta peak is weaker. From simulations, we can calculate the probabilities of each of the transitions and therefore an expected ratio of these peaks. This theoretical ratio is shown in the software, in this example, by the green lines, where you can, where you can see the alpha line is about five times taller than the beta line, and this is consistent with what we observe in the spectrum. Right. 
Moving into the center, we can see another family of lines. These are more numerous and have different overall heights. This is an example of an L series, in which case 10. As you can see, there are many more allowed transitions. Theoretical relative intensities are denoted in blue. And this matches the measured line shape in this part of the spectrum. And then if we move over to the far left, we have an example of an M series. Note that this contains one strong peak with smaller peaks on the higher and lower energy sides. Theoretical spectrum of osmium M series is shown in yellow and matches the characteristic peaks well in this region. So we can identify that as osmium. Now you might be thinking that this is all well and good to take a spectrum which is already identified and confidently be able to put these markers on. But what if you tried fitting in even more elements and use different series of lines? For example, try to fit lots and lots of K peaks, for example. Could you make that data fit? Well, Peak identification is a really, really important part of EDS and is a big potential source of, of mistakes. We'll talk about this process and how to do it properly at the end of today's seminar. But for now, I just want to show you what each real spectra looks like, different lines, and hopefully convince you that different series have a different characteristic shape. As you do more EDS, and as we go through some of the more examples today, you'll start to recognize these fingerprints, what makes identifying, and that makes identifying the peaks easier. When you're at the EDS computer looking at your data, there are also tools in, built into the software which help you ensure that you have the correct identifications too. So, so far we've talked a lot about EDS spectra and how these are important as they underpin everything we do in EDS. However, there are other common EDS applications that allow us to gain further insights into the specimen's composition or makeup and is very commonly used at CNS. One of the most common questions people want to answer when doing EDS is not just what's in my sample, but where is that element or elements in my sample? How does the chemical, chemical composition vary spatially? Turns out that this is something we can answer by using the scan coils of the electron microscope to constrain the electron beam to a specific location on the sample. We'll put it in a spot, take an EDS spectrum from that location, then adjust the scan coils so that we move the beam location, then take another EDS spectrum from that new location, and so on. If we care of careful about the series of locations on the sample that we select, we can build up either a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, sorry, a one-dimensional sequence of spectra acquired at equally spaced intervals in what we call a line scan, or we can acquire successive EDS spectra in a grid to generate a 2D map. At each pixel of the map, we have a full EDS spectrum which is analogous to what Arthur was talking about last week with his hyperspectral imaging. In order to determine the spatial distribution of a given element, we can see how a characteristic X-ray peaks intensity changes from pixel to pixel. The easiest way to do this is to integrate under the select peak. We will then generate a 2D matrix of the intensity values, which gives our map. A more intense color representation shows high count rate of that element was detected from that specific location. Okay, so now on to the second part of the talk, which is detection. So we're gonna look at some of the hardware used for EDS and learn about um, the various different types of detectors. Um, so this is a photo taken inside an SEM. As I mentioned earlier, there's several signals generated in electron microscopy, and these require different physical detectors. The EDS detector needed, needs to be fitted into the specific microscope. The exact configuration depends on whether it's an SEM or TM, what ports are available, and where those ports are. If you're looking inside a microscope and wondering which EDS detector is, usually it looks like something like this, where it's labeled collimator on that diagram. 
You need to be able to position the detector close to the microscope's pole piece when collecting data. There are several manufacturers of EDS equipment, and I'm going to try to keep this discussion as generic as possible. The main components of the detection system are similar. So over here on the right hand side, uh, we have Here on the right hand side, we have um, a schematic where the detector is housed, which is at the tip of the, the system. And we saw the end of this where it says collimator on the last side. So x rays enter the detector through the collimator assembly, which constrains the direction of the x rays, which can enter the sensor. And it's aimed at the specimen surface. They then go through an electron trap, which, as the name suggests, prevents electrons from entering the sensor and window before entering the sensor itself. The window is necessary because the sensor needs to be kept under vacuum conditions. The microscope chambers, in particularly in SEMs, are often raised in pressure for environmental imaging or for venting. The sensor assembly is often bolted onto a slide mic mechanism to enable close proximity of the detector to the specimen. The detector needs to be cooled to reduce thermal noise. And we also need some electronics um, called a preamplifier, which we're going to get into more detail on shortly. We have several EDS detectors in our labs at CNS. Uh, these are currently from two of the major EDS vendors, one called EDAX and the other Oxford Instruments. I'm not going to go into detail on the technical specifications of each detector as they all vary slightly from each other. But instead, I'm going to try to keep this talk pretty general. However, if you're looking to perform EDS or SEM, oh, sorry, on an SEM, uh, or on a focused ion beam, a FIP, or on a TEM, then rest assured, we have a, a selection of options for you. I had to get a cheesy plug in there somehow. So as I alluded to a couple of slides ago, it's important to position the detector correctly in the microscope. The EDS detector must point at the location the electron beam interacts with the specimen. We can only bring the detector so close to the sample as it must not touch the pole piece of the microscope. We're also constrained by the available flanges on the microscope. Therefore, the setup is different for each microscope type and for each detector. And we need to define certain parameters which feed into the models that we'll be using for quantification calculations. So the first of these terms I'm going to define is the interse intersection distance, which is the distance between the bottom of the pole piece and where the detector normal intersects the electron beam, marked here in orange. The elevation angle is between the specimen's horizontal plane and the direct line to the detector, which is shown here in green. You'll note that on the previous slide, I did not define the intersection distance as the working distance of the microscope in the case of an SEM. This is because the intersection distance and elevation angle are defined by how the detector is bolted onto the microscope. But the working distance of operation can be adjusted at any time by the SEM user. However, for optimal signal strength, the working distance should be set to the, to the intersection distance. This can be determined experimentally by measuring the counts as a function of working distance. You can see that this line shape is asymmetric. It's better to have too long a working distance and too short a working distance. If you don't know what the optimal value is for the system you're working on, please ask one of us. Okay, so now we're going to talk in a little more detail on how the sensor itself works, uh, the signal that's generated, and how we use that to measure the energy of the incoming X-rays. Most modern EDS detectors use what's called a silicon drift detector to detect the incoming X-rays. Unsurprisingly, this is a silicon-based device. 
uh, the X-ray enters the chip and generates electron hole pairs. Higher the energy of the incoming X-ray, the more electron hole pairs or charge are generated. Therefore, by measuring the amount of charge generated in the device when the X-ray is absorbed, we can measure the energy of the incoming X-ray hat. The chip is designed such that a series of rings produce an electric field, which guides the electrons to the anode, which is located in the center. And uh, these, um, these rings um, drive the electrons to the center where they collected. If we were to look at the output trace on the sensor and monitor the current, we would see a peak in the current, the size of which would correspond to the energy of the incoming X-ray. However, in reality, it's actually more practical for us to put the output through what we call a charge to voltage converter um, or preamplifier, which magnifies the signal so that it's easier for us to analyze it. We like working with a bigger signal, essentially. Therefore, we actually measure a voltage rather than a current, but the idea is the same. So here are examples of the output signal from the preamp. What we get is a series of plateaus and step ups. Plotted along the x axis is time, and then the y axis is voltage. Every now and again, we see a sharp drop, and this is actually from the system discharging the capacitor because we can't keep up building keep on building up charge forever and ever. However, this is not the important feature here. I just want to concentrate on these little upward steps, which you can see there. We see a plateau when there is nothing going on in the detector. So when there's no X-ray entering and no charge is being generated. However, when an X-ray enters, the charge is generated and we see a rise in charge. The increase in step height corresponds to the energy of the incoming X-ray. The delay between steps corresponds to the rate the X-ray is entering the detector. Now, on the right-hand side is a zoomed-in picture of one kind of very special type of event. And that's what happens when two X-rays enter the detector close together. Here, what we see is not a step, but instead it's uh, a rise with a kink in it. So th this measurement is difficult for the uh, pulse process for the system to um, process, and so it ends up getting rejected. We need a way to figure out what needs to be rejected, and that job is done by the pulse processor. This job is to determine which pulses we are not going to use in a spectra because it could have been those kinked events we just saw. Pulse processor must be correctly optimized to quickly and accurately measure the voltage step, um, increase for each X-ray event, and then it's going to enter the measured value into a data set. In order to generate a spectrum, we group or we bin the data into discrete intervals typically 5 EV or 10 EV, so that all events which corresponded to an incoming en energy range within 5 or 10 KV, sorry, 10, 5 or 10 EV are grouped together in a histogram. And it's this histogram that forms our EDS spectrum. Those of you who have done EDS before have probably come across the term dead time. This is an important way in which the EDS operator can determine whether we set the experiment up well. The dead time is based on the ratio of output counts to input counts. If the x-rays are well spaced out in time and none overlap with each other, then the pulse processor doesn't reject any data. And this ratio will be one. Therefore, the dead time is uh, zero. However, if the X-rays are entering the detector at a very fast rate and a lot of data is rejected by the pulse processor, then the dead time will start to increase. We don't want too high a dead time because that means we're actually recording, we aren't actually recording any data. 
We also don't want a dead time of zero, as that means that the detector is sitting idle for our long periods, and so our count rate is really low. We'll talk more about how to optimize dead time in a little while, um, but at the moment I'm just introducing the term dead time to those who might be unfamiliar with it. One dial we have to, available to us to adjust how the pulse processor handles data is to adjust the processing time, also in some software known as the AMP time. Processing time, processing time is the window of time that the detector is counting charge for. If we use a longer time, then we have better counting statistics and can get a more accurate measurement of the voltage jump and therefore energy. However, this can result in longer dead time. As with longer processing time, we are increasing the chance of another X-ray entering the detector in that time window. On the other hand, short processing times allow for faster acquisition times, sorry, it's faster acquisition rates with lower dead time, but the downside here is resolution. So on the right-hand side here, we've got a silver emission line collected with long and short pulse processing times. We can see more features of the peak with the long pro pulse processing time, and these become blurred out when collected under a short processing time. Selecting the processing time therefore depends on what you need to do. If you need counting statistics, but not spectrum resolution, for example, when you're mapping, then a short pulse processing time works well and gives you the best signal to noise maps. However, if you need good spectrum resolution, perhaps you, perhaps you have two peaks which are very close to each other or even overlap, then you will need to use longer, po po longer pulse processing time and we'll talk about uh, how to, to set that up and optimize right at the end of this webinar. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to the third section of the talk, theoretical considerations. So we've already learned about how X-rays are generated from the interaction of the incident electron beam and specimen that this results in a spectrum which we can assign these peaks to various elements and go into detail about how the signal itself is detected. Here we're going to look in more detail at how we might try to use this information to get in an EDS spectrum to quantify how much is, is present of a given element. The way this is done is we use built-in models and assumptions. So it's really really easy when doing EDS, to click on the button that says quantify in the software, then merrily write down the numbers that the system gives you, and then assume that these are correct. And we see an awful lot of people doing that. Unfortunately, much more often than not, these results are incorrect, and the reasons why these are incorrect vary. However, over the next few slides, I'm hoping to go over some of the main principles of the calculations that are performed, and try to point out where the problems can crop up so that you will be more prepared to spot where models may or may not be appropriate for your data and have a better understanding of what might have gone wrong. In order to, think, to keep things consistent, I'm going to concentrate on the case of SEM here, as I think that applies to, to more of you. Okay, so the last consideration we need to make is in relation to what happens below the surface of the sample. In SEM, we're usually dealing with a bulk sample, and that's what we'll assume here. When the incident electron beam impinges on the surface, the majority of electrons enter the sample and then undergo a series of cascades. We can simulate many thousands of cascades using Monte Carlo methods to provide us with an underlying um, understanding of these trajectories as shown in the diagram on the right hand. This diagram um, shows the volume of interaction, which is the gray um, bulb, along with integrated number of electrons as a function of depth in the blue plot. As the electrons on average move deeper down into the sample, they lose energy. Each collision is a possible source of energy loss. Therefore, the energy distribution is not flat or constant as a function of depth, and instead it drops off. 
as we discussed, different X-ray energy lines are at different energies, and so require different electron energies to excite them. Very deep down in the sample, the electrons may not have enough energy to excite certain high energy transitions. Also, in order to be detected, the X-ray needs to be able to leave the specimen and reach the EDS detector. This too requires a certain amount of energy and results in what we call the escape depth. Taking these two concepts forward, uh, here we're comparing the X-ray generation and escape depth of low and high energy X-rays for a fixed electron beam energy. On the left is the case of low energy X-rays. These can be generated much deeper in the sample because they do not require high energy X-rays to generate them. In contrast, in the right-hand side diagram, which is for high energy X-rays, these require higher energy electrons, and so these can only be found near the top of the sample. As I just said, the escape depth is the distance be beneath the surface from which an X-ray of a given energy can escape from. Low energy X-rays have a shorter X-ray escape depth than high energy X-rays. So even though more low energy X-rays can be generated within the bulk of the sample, as indicated, by the total area of the two blocks on the left-hand side. The region from, which, from the sample from which they can be detected from is constrained to the uppermost region, which is shaded in light blue. Therefore, the yield of low energy X-rays is low. On the other hand, for high energy X-rays, shown on the right-hand side, a much higher proportion of high energy X-rays can be detected simply because these X-rays can escape from a deeper in the sample. I should point out this is definitely a cartoon <laughs> and is not drawn to scale. So the ratios of high to low energy X-rays varies um, substantially um, with instant beam energy, material composition, and density. This is just a guide. To give an actual example of this, uh, here we've got a fairly simple system, which is quartz mineral standard, so SiO2, and that's got a thin carbon coating on top of it. What we did was to take an EDS spectrum of the same region of the sample at different SEM energies, so from 25 kV in red down to 5 kV in green, and the different energies are shown up there in the top right in the legend. Spectrum have been normalized so that the silicon K-peak is of the same intensity for each spectrum. You can kind of see here. And we can see very different peak heights for the lower energy peaks down here. At high incident beam energy, which is the red plot, we see a relatively higher number of counts for the silicon K-peak, which is the highest energy peak in the system and a smaller number of relative counts for the oxygen and carbon peaks, which are lower energy X-ray lines. This is because, although oxygen peaks are excited deep within the quartz, those that are deep cannot escape, as I described on the previous slide. In contrast, the green curve, which is from the lowest beam energy, is quite different, with an intense oxygen, relatively intense oxygen and carbon peak. At first, this might seem surprising. But then we think back to the volume of interaction discussion. I've got some examples of the volume of interaction here at different energies. And so we can see that the lower the energy, the more constrained the surface, the electrons are to the surface. And therefore, the X-ray distribution is more constrained to the surface for lower energy incident electrons. If a higher proportion of the low energy oxygen signals are generated nearer the surface, then more of them can escape. And then this gives the bigger signal. The case of carbon is special because carbon was applied as a coating on the uppermost surface of the specimen. Carbon is locally constrained to the top. Therefore, it is readily excited when the volume of interaction is more constrained to the top of the specimen, as it is a low energy, and hence larger carbon peak at low energy. So the takeaway message here, even for a simple, seemingly simple system, 
is that the incident beam energy plays a really important role in the relative peak heights of X-ray lines, and therefore on data analysis. You might think from the previous slide, well, why not just always use low beam energy for EDS? And you'd be right in considering this as using low energy um, does have its advantages. For example, increasing the intensity of the low energy species, as we just discussed, and often very importantly, in the 2D spatial resolution, because the volume of interaction is smaller, as we saw on the previous slide. However, Going to low, lower energy has a significant disadvantage in that you need to have a higher energy, um, you need to have a high energy to excite the X-ray lines that you're trying to detect. Turns out that we want to have a higher energy electron beam than the energy of the X-ray transition we're trying to detect. How much higher in energy is determined by the ionization cross-section, which is given the letter Q. Earlier we discussed that the underlying principle of EDS is that we knock out a core shell electron and ionize the element. Well, the probability of that happen is given by Q, which is defined by this equation. As you can see from the equation and the definition of the terms below, very material dependent and transition dependent, as well as depending on the energy of the incident beam. An important parameter in EDS is called the overvoltage, which is the title of this slide. We can define the overvoltage, given the letter U, as the ratio of the incident beam energy to the ionization energy of a particular X ray line. We can look up the ionization energy of a given X ray line in a table and then determine if we're a factor of two, three, four, or whatever, higher. Um, than what's needed to knock out that particular core level electron. An example of a plot of ionization cross section, so essentially probability versus over voltage is shown here in the plot. At very low values, we can see, so for example, less than about 1 or 1.5, um, the probability is very low and not maximized. However, as U increases beyond at least 2, the yield transition is greatly increased. So as a general rule of thumb, we need to apply beam energy of at least twice the X-ray excitation energy, which is known as the twice the ionization energy. Taking this concept of the ionization cross-section, we can estimate the number of X-rays generated within the unit volume. This is N. Uh, this can be calculated as shown here. What I'd like to stress here is the number of X-rays generated is proportional to the ionization cross-section Q. Putting this together with what we learned on the last slide confirms that the overvoltage curve, which is material and transition dependent, affects the yield of X-rays significantly. So we need to be very careful about our selection of the SEM beam energy. An important feature of the spectrum that we need to understand and build into our model is the background. And this is eventually what will be subtracted from the data to give peak areas. As I described earlier, the smooth background is due to what is termed the Bremsstrahlung radiation. This is electromagnetic radiation that is emitted when electrons are accelerated. If we look at the Bohr model and consider some trajectories electrons might take as they pass through the material close to atoms, it's clear that they may be scattered. This change in velocity causes them to emit an X-ray, the energy of which depends on the degree of scattering. Since continuous distribution of scattering events is possible, this gives rise to a smooth function. We can model this distribution numerically using Kramer's law. However, if we compare Kramer's law with real data, we see that it only fits the background while at higher energies. Below, say, 5 keV, we see a deviation from Kramer's law and background falls off to zero. So in blue here, we have the Kramer's law curve, and we see that this does not match the experimentally observed background shown in the, the real spectrum. Instead, the red curve matches better, which accounts for absorption. So this is due to self-absorption. 
where the X-rays are reabsorbed in the material, as we discussed before. Low energy X-ray absorption depends on the material composition and on the incident energy. So we need an extra term in our model to account for this self-absorption. Background is often therefore fitted numerically to the equation given on this slide, um, for which the middle term is based on Kramer's law. Of course, this is all great, but at some point we actually need to jump in and start using the information that's constrained in the characteristic peaks, right? Well, first model I want to introduce is called the K-ratio estimation. This represents one of the simplest approaches for EDS quantification, and so it makes a good place to start. What we do here is we measure the intensity of the X-ray peak of interest from the sample and compare it to what is, uh, it is for a pure reference sample. Very important that when we do this, we keep all parameters the same. For example, beam energy, current, and working distance. The concentration is then estimated as the ratio of relative intensities as expressed in this equation. So here's an example of some data collected and analyzed using the K-ratio method. This time our sample is stainless steel. We've used pure nickel, chromium, and iron references and collected the spectra under the same conditions, including for the same stainless steel sample. We've identified the iron, the chromium, and the nickel peaks over here, and collected spectra under the same conditions. Where is it? When we take the ratio of the peak intensities of the stainless steel peaks compared to the references, just as outlined on the previous slide, we get these ratios at the top. These give our estimated relative compositions by the K-ratio method and standard analysis. If you look at these numbers carefully though, you'll see that they don't quite add up to one. In fact, their sum is a little bigger than one, which indicates an error. So this model isn't perfect, but it gives a rough compositional analysis. Building on that, the next model I'd like to introduce is the SAF correction. This is one of the most commonly used EDS models and is available in all software that I've worked with. What this model does is it takes the K ratio that we just talked about and adds a couple of corrections for common effects in SCM EDS. To achieve this, we consider the atomic number factor, absorption, and fluorescence effects, all of which I'll go into in more detail over the next couple of slides. Why do we need to do this? Well, on the previous example, we saw that the weight percentages didn't quite add up to 100, which is not physically possible. The K-ratio method assumes a linear relationship between the weight fraction and intensity ratio, as plotted here on the right-hand side. However, if we measure this, we find a non-linear relationship, which gives these curved lines, and these can be modeled reasonably well by a ZAF correction. First part of the ZAF correction we'll consider is the Z or Z. This corresponds to the atomic number correction. I mentioned earlier that the incident beam electrons lose energy as they have more energy and more collisions in the specimen. This is because they undergo collisions as they pass through the material in a series of cascades. Probability of these scattering events occurring depends on the local density in the material, so on the atomic number. The higher the atomic number, the higher the probability of a scattering event. Another important phenomenon, phenomenon is generation of backscattered electrons. Those of you who do regularly SEM will probably have used backscattered imaging to show differences in your sample when you have various regions of high and low atomic number. More background electrons are generated for a higher density, higher atomic number region, and these look brighter on a backscattered image. Both of these factors, the rate of backscattered electron generation and the rate at which the beam electrons lose their energy affects the number of X-rays generated at a given depth in the specimen. We therefore need to define terms that are correct for this, which are expressed here. First, we have the stopping power, which is dependent on the energy loss per unit depth. So S is equal to minus the rate of change of the energy loss on the depth. And then we have correction factor for the number of backscattered electrons. And remember, these therefore generate x-rays from the specimen. The backscatter correction is based on the ratio of x-rays actually attenuated to what it would have been if there wasn't any backscattering. 
A good thing to know is that the correction factor is most influential when analyzing light elements in high density materials. You should keep this in mind when analyzing data as expected uh, and expect a larger force of error for light elements in these situations. So the next correction term is A, or the absorption correction. The way I like to think about this is that an X-ray is generated, but before it can reach the detector, it needs to escape the spectrum. Last week, Arthur talked about photon absorption in the visible range. Exactly the same phenomenon can occur for X-rays. They can be absorbed by the specimen. Probability of absorption rate depends on the density of the material, the energy of the X-ray, and the composition of the material in particular depth. The deeper you are in the material, the more likely the X-ray is to be absorbed, as it must travel further through the material before escaping. And the last correction is the term of the ZAF, or fluorescence. Turns out that this is not just the incoming beam electrons that can excite the atom, but creating a hole and resulting in the emission of an X-ray. High energy X-rays can do this as well. What happens here is the high energy X-ray knocks out the core level electron, creating a hole in the core level. Then, similar to before, an outer electron shell electron relaxes down to fill that hole, and an X-ray is emitted. In this process, the initial high energy X-ray is absorbed, and a lower energy X-ray is emitted. Conservation of energy means that this always needs to be the case with the remaining energy given to the escaping electron. Therefore, an X-ray of a given energy can only excite lower energy X-ray lines. This is what is depicted in the table here. Nickel K alpha is the highest energy X-ray in the system with an energy of 8.3 keV. It can be absorbed and fluoresce as iron, K alpha or chromium K alpha, both of which are lower energy. Iron can, be, can fluoresce as chromium. Therefore, fluorescence makes it seem like there are more low energy species present than there actually are. We need to take this into account to accurately quantify our results. Therefore, to estimate the relative weight percent in the sample, we calculate the K ratio, divide by the ZAF correction, which is usually with the aid of software as these uh, theoretical numbers, and then multiply by 100%. There are two approaches to EDS quantification. First, which is easier but less accurate, it's called standardless analysis. Here, the operator relies on values built into the software model for references. This is the approach that many people take, as it's the easiest. I would like to emphasize that it often leads to significant inaccuracies and to advise against it for anything other than rough work. A more thorough approach is to use standards and collect reference data under the same conditions as you collect your specimen data. This is preferred approach for quantification and it has a built-in check that you can sum your data and see if the total comes to 100%. If it doesn't, then you know something went wrong in the analysis. Of course, it takes longer, it requires good references. We do have a nice set of references though available to you if you'd like to pursue this, so please talk to Tim or I if this is the case. So the ZAF model isn't perfect, and there are many scenarios when it falls short. On this slide, there are a few commonly uh, occurring conditions that can arise in real samples, which make analyses with ZAF particularly problematic. Of these, I've highlighted the assumptions that for real samples are frequently not true. Most people's samples are not homogeneous. In fact, they are often interesting variations that we won't study. However, the model assumes that the specimen is homogeneous within the volume of interaction, which is often microns in size. I'm sure you can imagine that at CNS, we often encounter smaller features of interest in this. SCM samples are often not flat. And this again is often partly what makes them interesting. This model does not account for topographic variations though. Sample is infinitely thick. If you have a bulk sample, then the model does pretty well. However, often people have thin samples, porous samples, or want to look at the uppermost layers, which the model does not do well. Talking of thin samples, let's shift gears for just one slide. Talk briefly about the case of doing EDS in the TM. In the TM, we also have a thin sample and nearly always a higher energy electron beam than in an SCM. Therefore, the trajectory of the incident electrons and the X-ray interaction is no longer a bulb shape, 
but is instead confined to a much smaller region near where the beam is incident on the specimen surface. Because of this, the ZAF correction terms we just discussed are much less influential for TEM than in SEM, and analysis for TEM is actually much simpler. The K ratio method that we described earlier, where we take the ratio of the pure reference samples X ray line intensity of the specimen's X ray line, is the dominant factor in determining the concentration. There is a correction factor called the Cliff Lorimer factor, which is applied in many models. That accounts for specific material specific ionization, fluorescence, and absorption. As I just mentioned, this does not vary as greatly as the SAF correction factors between the different samples. The downside of doing EDS in the TM, though, is that because you have a thinner sample, you have less material to generate X rays, and so your counting statistics are much, much poorer. But you do get better spatial resolution. So just to recap a bit, we've learned that EDS is, what EDS is, uh, what information we can get from it, how the detectors work, and look to some of the models that we can apply for quantification. How do we put this all together and sit down at the microscope and collect meaningful data? This is what we're starting to talk through here. First thing we're gonna do is to set the working distance so that it coincides with the intersection distance. If you don't know what this distance is on the particular microscope you're using, ask the CNS st staff member who looks after that instrument. Then look at the periodic table which lists X-ray line energies and possibly write them out in a table. If you know what's in your sample, then you can set the beam energy to twice the highest energy line you need to excite. However, if you don't know what's in your sample, or you want to be safe, which is best practice, Start with the highest energy beam of the SEM and collect a spectrum there. You can then look for the peaks and adjust the beam energy for the subsequent spectra. The important thing here is to make sure that you're at least twice the energy of the excitation needed for the highest energy line. Once you've selected the beam energy, you will use and set your working distance. You, you'll, need, you, you'll need to set up the detector and optimize the count rate. Modern software versions include a rate meter, which can make this part a little easier to gauge as it shows you whether you're getting the, the maximum counts out from the detector. For older systems, this is more manual. In either case, this goes back to our discussion about the pulse processor. We need to optimize the detector window time so that the dead time isn't crazily high, so not more than 30 to 50%, depending on the type of detector you have and what you're looking to achieve. And that you are detecting so far, aren't detecting so fast that your resolution would be really poor. If you find that you can't get enough counts here, even after optimizing the pulse processor, then increase the beam current on the SEM. It's also possible that you may have too many X rays entering the detector for the electronics to handle, and you may need to reduce the SEM sample current. CNS staff member can show you how to do this uh, if you don't know how to do that already. Next up is to decide how long to collect your spectrum. And we'll leave this for now as I'll talk about how to determine if you have a good enough counting statistics in a few slides. However, typically you'll want in the order of millions of counts. Once you have your spectrum, you can use the EDS software to identify the peaks according to the energy and line shape, as we discussed earlier on. If you're looking to quantify the data, you can then have two options. You can go back and collect reference data under the exact same conditions as you collected your sample spectrum, or if you choose to use standard list analysis, then all you need to do is click on the appropriate button of the software and have a complete composition. Either way, the key message here is to be skeptical of the results and put thought into whether the values you've obtained are realistic. On this slide, I want to revisit our discussion of the shapes of energy lines and explain more specifically how we use this when confronted with a real spectrum. This is an EDS spectrum of a potentially unknown material that we need to identify the peaks of. First thing that jumps out to me is the intense peak here at uh, 0 0.5 kV. This is all on its own and is likely to be oxygen, a very common element. We also have a large peak over here which has a slight shoulder. This looks like a K-series to me with a strong peak around 2.3 kV. It doesn't have any additional lines that would be characteristic of an L or an M series. If you look this up, the energy of the peak coincides with that of sulfur, K-peak. 
and the line shape of an asymmetric peak, including a higher energy shoulder, is consistent with what was being expected for Sulfur's K series. Now, most interestingly, is this group of peaks here between 4 and 6 kV. I happen to recognize that the relative intensities look like an L series. So you can look up in the table or use software to find out if there are any L lines with those energies and relative intensities. And they happen to fit well to barium L. The key test, and this is very important, is that if we excite the barium L series, we should also, we should also excite the lower energy barium M series, which would be around 0.9 MeV, which is there. And so this means we likely have barium. What I want to emphasize is that if we didn't see this barium M peak, then we would know that our identif identification of the barium L was incorrect. All families of lines must be present if they can be excited by the incident beam. At this point, we want to ask ourselves, does this make sense? Well, I happen to have expected this particular result as the data was taken from a mineral barite, which has a chemical formula BASO4. It's good to check that you haven't identified any peaks that are incredibly rare or any impossible elements though. Another area that we need to pay close attention to when is when two X-ray lines are of similar energy and the peaks overlap, as this can be pretty tricky. An example of this is shown here in the red zone of the sample spectrum. The overlap makes it hard to analyze these peaks, as we must need to involve the peaks before analysis can be performed, rather than simply integrating underneath a single peak. Ideally, for analysis, if we have multiple lines for an element, it's best to perform analyses on lines that don't overlap. Overlaps are much more likely to occur at lower energy regions in the spectrum because there are more lines there that can be excited in this region. So we often try to use higher energy peaks if possible. There are a couple of common artifacts in EDS that I'd like you to be aware of. First are some peaks, also known as pulse pileup peaks. These occur when two X-rays enter the detector simultaneously and the pulse processor doesn't reject this event. Instead, a higher energy peak is formed. You get more sun peaks at higher energy counts, higher count rates. They usually occur at an energy of double the most intense peak. Another type of artifact are sun peaks, sorry, system peaks. System peaks are X-rays which are generated by electrons that are bouncing around in the chamber and interact with the physical hardware that is not in your sample, generating X-rays from that material. In SEM, a common system peak is aluminium. Escape peaks are a peak of artificially lower energy. What happens here is the X-ray enters the EDS detector, but before it is absorbed and converted into charge, the silicon K-alpha X-ray is produced by fluorescence and exits the detector. Therefore, the detected energy is lower by the energy of that silicon X-ray, which is 1.74 kV. So once you've identified the main X-ray lines, figured out whether you have artifacts and identified these, if you have them, you start looking in more and more detail near the background in search of low concentration species. But how do you know if a peak is real or is it noise? Well, you need to have good number, number of counts, as we said earlier, typically in the millions, for good counting statistics. If you don't have this, then you will not have good counting statistics or not be able to identify or quantify low concentration species. To achieve better statistics, you can either count for longer or try increasing the beam current, so long as you don't introduce artifacts from an increased dead time. You should also be taking multiple measurements on your sample as well. So the expression here is a useful tool for determining whether a peak is statistically relevant. You have 99% confidence that the peak is real if the intensity of the peak height is more than three times the square root of the background intensity. One of the questions uh, that new users of EDS often have, especially after one of our staff have explained about the possible inaccuracies and assumptions of the theoretical models for EDS is, well, what, are the accurate, what is the accuracy of this technique? If you perform standardless analysis under ideal conditions, um, i.e. you have a homogeneous flat sample and have good counting statistics, have identified all the peaks correctly, and generally been extremely careful, then analysis accuracy is around plus or minus 5%. For example, 
if you have measured that you have 50% by weight of an element in your specimen, then you will be in the range of 47.5 to 52.5 weight percent. Often though, the error bars are actually much larger than this due to inhomogeneous specimens or incorrect data collection. For better results, it's worth taking the time to perform analysis of standards. Again, Tim or I can help you with this. You can expect here to get an improved accuracy of plus or minus 2%, which means that the range for 50% by weight sample would be 49 to 51%, which is much tighter. This accuracy varies for different elements. As we discussed earlier, the correction factors vary with atomic number and lighter elements are harder to analyze by EDS. And of course, we, uh, you need to, enough material to generate the statistically relevant peak, which is typically around 0.1 weight percent. So I wanted to end with a slide that I hope is helpful, which summarizes a few of the common problems we see for EDS analysis. Often we need to use high beam currents for EDS um, than we do for SCM imaging so that we can achieve good counting statistics. However, with more beam current, many samples would charge more. One common way around this is to apply conductive coating. However, if you use gold or platinum palladium alloy, these metals have lots of X-ray lines and they can sometimes have overlaps with the elements that you're interested in which, as I've said, complicates our analysis. Strongly recommend that you use a carbon coating if at all possible, and we do have a carbon coater available in B15A. Carbon is a low energy X-ray peak. And many EDS software models have built-in um, boxes which can account for a carbon coating layer. Spend time with your data and look carefully at the peaks. We often see incorrect assigned peaks, and this, of course, leads to incorrect analysis. Uh, the detector calibration is checked by staff and service engineers regularly. However, we do make mistakes. So if the peak energy is looking correct, ask a staff member, and we can verify that the whether or not the calibration is correct. I hope now that I've convinced you that the most accurate way to do EDS is with standards. If you're going this route, make sure that you plan your experiment carefully and collect data under the same condition that you collected your reference data. Otherwise, all your hard work will be for nothing. And as this diagram implies, volume of interaction or bulb is important to keep in mind when doing EDS. The X-rays are generated from a large volume of volume, often a few microns deep and wide. And this makes EDS a much lower spatial resolution technique than secondary electron imaging. If you really need high spatial resolution, you might consider using a lower energy beam, and that is sufficient to excite the lines of interest that you need. Or consider TM, which has much higher spatial resolution due to the high beam energy and thin sample. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge those who have contributed slides and diagrams to this presentation, folks at Oxford, EDAX, and CNS. If you're looking for more information, there are a couple of excellent resources listed here. Also, Tim and I are available, available to answer questions and to support you. Uh, I usually concentrate more on the TM, whereas Tim is our main SEM expert, but I'm happy to help out there too if Tim's busy. And I want to end with a plug. Uh, so next week, we're going to have a talk which I'm really looking forward to, which is by Nikki Watson. Nikki joined our staff about six months ago and brought with her a uh, vast array of skills and knowledge from her time at the Whitehead Institute. Um, and she's gonna talk about how to prepare biological specimens for electron microscopy. And you can sign up for that on the CNS website. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh,